All right, well, it's a pleasure to be with, uh, with you all here this morning uh, to sing the praises of the Lord and to read his word. If you have your Bibles, would you turn to Luke chapter 23 with me? Uh, Luke 23. This morning, uh, as we begin to look at the sufferings of Christ, we're jumping right into the middle of his sufferings, uh, and we're looking at a very familiar scene and words that Christ said that we all uh, can remember very clearly. And uh, what I want to get from this uh, is just to remember the benevolence of Christ, the love of Christ towards us on the cross. And so if you have your Bibles in Luke 23, we'll begin reading in verse 33 together. The scripture says, And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him, and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself if he be the Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldier also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar, and saying, If thou be uh, the king of the Jews, save thyself. And a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. And now let's go to our Lord in prayer. Father God, we come before you, and Lord, we thank you for your goodness towards us, your love in Christ Jesus, and Lord, we pray that you'd help us to see that love this morning. Lord, we pray that you'd also help us to show it to others by proclaiming forgiveness in Christ's name, Uh, Lord, by being patient with one another, and uh, Lord, doing uh, all that we can for the love of Christ's sake. Lord, we pray for our missionaries where they are today, help them to uh, do your will, to uh, be pleasing in your sight. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would give us opportunity also to serve you. Uh, Lord, be with our leaders in this nation in this uh, time of crisis. Lord, we pray that you would be with them to comfort them. Uh, Lord, to help them to know that so far as they're faithful to you, uh, Lord, that all things work together for the good of them that love God to them who are the called according to his purpose. Uh, Lord, we pray that where we've sinned against you, that you would forgive us. And Lord, that you would prosper us until the day of Christ's coming. And it's in his name we pray it all. Amen. So in our passage, we read about the first words that came out of Jesus' mouth on the cross. And I'd like us to first see the circumstances in which these words came, and the malice of Christ's killers, how they hated him, how Christ's death was the cruelest of all deaths. In verse 33, when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the malefactors, one on the right hand, and and the other on the left. Crucifixion, of course, we know was a slow death. We know that it was a cruel death. It was a death by asphyxiation. A death by uh, exhaustion, trying to breathe. We know that even usually, if... Uh, someone who was sentenced to die, was hung on the cross, and yet later was taken down, they would usually nonetheless die. Uh, That this was a sure death sentence and a cruel death sentence. He was also here treated like a criminal, like any other criminal condemned to die. Yet in Isaiah 53, 9, we read, He made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Even uh, in their taking his garment, it says that they uh, parted his garment and cast lots over his coat. Uh, They uh, had no regard for him at all. Uh, It was a horrible death that Jesus, of course, died. And in it, he had the cruelest of insults hurled at him. In verse 35, the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he be Christ, the chosen of God. 
they were uh, questioning his claim to be Christ. They, they were questioning whether he had indeed come to save men or that he had saved men. They said, he saved others, let him save himself. Of course, we know the purpose that Jesus was dying for. It was to save others. Uh, Jesus couldn't have it both ways. He either had to die and atone for the sins of his people and save them, or he had to save himself. That was the choice that Christ had. And the insult that was thrown at him by the rulers was so cruel to say that Jesus ought to save himself as he had saved others. Jesus was giving his life mercifully for his people, and they were mocking him for it. They also mocked his claim to be the king of kings. In verse 36, the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar and saying, if thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And a superscription was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. He was insulted. He was demeaned. The humiliation of Christ was great. Elsewhere, of course, we read how he was stripped of all his clothing and hung on the cross naked. He was spit on. He was derided as he went up to Calvary. And later in our own passage, we read about even the malefactor on his left hand began to curse him and say, if you are the Christ, save yourself and us. Again, they gave him a cruel death, dying as no other man ever did. And this was the purest of all victims, the man who, above anyone, did not deserve to die. In Isaiah 53, 9 again, he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Luke 4, 18, he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. A gentle Savior a loving Savior, a Savior that came to do only good and no evil. He was dying on the cross. He was being derided. He was put down, suffering on our behalf. He was the one who was on the cross with his back freshly flayed. His, uh, the splinters from the cross rubbing against his tender muscles freshly expo exposed. He was the one who pushed up on the nail in his feet. He was the one who, with his precious breath, says here, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. In the end, he saves love even for his murderers. Their own victim prays for them. He, of course, pleads for their good first. He says, Father, forgive them. Even as they're killing him, even as they're in the act, he says, Father, forgive them. He might have held up vengeance for them. He might have prayed more than 12 legions of angels to come to his aid and bring judgment then. But even as he was beginning to feel the first pains in his lungs, he lifted up, Father, forgive them. That's what was first on his mind. The first thing that he said, the reason he came to this point, forgive them. He fled on their Ignorance, And this I take from uh, a sermon by Charles Spurgeon, where he said, Our Savior did, as it were, look his enemies through and through to find something in them that he could urge in their favor. 
but he could not but he could see nothing until his wise affectionate eye lit upon their ignorance they know not what they do how careful he surveyed the circumstances and the character of those for whom he importuned just so it is with him in heaven christ is no careless advocate for his people and i would say no careless advocate even though he was in the midst of suffering, even though he was dying then. He thought not of himself, but he thought so deeply about his people, so deeply even about the murderers, to say, Father, forgive them, because I see they know not what they do. 1 Corinthians 2.8 says, None of the princes of the world knew this, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And of course, this doesn't excuse their sin. The fact that uh, a a murderer doesn't see the circumstances of his own murder clearly doesn't excuse that he's a murderer. But nonetheless, Christ grabs onto this. Christ sees that God had blinded their eyes, that God had brought them to this point. He had kept them from the knowledge of Jesus Christ so that he would die on the cross for his people. Jesus pleads this circumstance in their favor. And he pleads, of course, his own blood in their favor. In verse 34, Father, forgive them. He addressed his Father as he had so many times in eternity. He calls to him and he says, Father, I am your beloved, only begotten Son. I am you that ha- I am He that has been with you from the beginning, who shared in your glory, who came because of your love for your people. And so I plead as your Son, spare them, forgive them of their sins. He pleads His own self on their behalf. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You know that even those who were at the cross and nailing him there, who would not many days forward be saved, that Jesus was dying because of the sin of killing him. He was dying to forgive that sin. He was dying to cleanse them. In Romans 5.10, we also see that this is of us. How Jesus pleads this way for you and me. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. When we were enemies, when we in our sin, put Jesus on the cross. When we were ignorant, when we were without God in the world, Christ died to reconcile us to Himself. And so I'd like us to just reflect on this goodness of Jesus. Even when we sin, even when we disobeyed Him, He prayed for us. And He said, Father, forgive them. And notice also how His prayer is effectual. That it does obtain what He prays for. In Matthew 27, verse 50, Jesus, when He had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. At this sight, when Jesus died, many surely did think that the judgment of God had come, that the books would be opened, and men would be judged out of them, whatever they did. When they saw the saints coming into the city, they must have thought, The Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all the ungodly for all their ungodly deeds and the ungodly words which they have spoken against God's people. 
But we then read that when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. I think a statement of faith here. They saw that he was a righteous man, the only righteous man that ever lived. The Son of God had died on the cross, and God had taken notice of it. God had forgiven men of their sins. Of those that were left who crucified him at the very end, they were spared. They were brought to believe on Jesus. And when the Holy Ghost came down, surely many of them joined themselves to the church and were forgiven of their sins. When Christ said, Father, forgive them, the Father forgave them. The Father loves them. He would not deny the prayer of His dear Son. Not only though towards them, but towards all of us. All of His people. When Christ prays for you, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. You are forgiven. You are made clean. You are sanctified in the end because Jesus prayed for you. John 12, 31. Now is the judgment of this world, and now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. A sure thing that he draws to himself. In Romans 3.25, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare, I say, uh, for the, uh, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. He is set forth as a propitiation to accomplish what he came to do. And so, this morning I'd like to first address any unbelievers here. If there are any that don't know the Lord Jesus. I'd just like to ask, what other reason do you need to come to Jesus Christ than that He prays for you? Than that He offers Himself to you this morning? Surely when Jesus was praying, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. It was an invitation to come and have forgiveness in Him. Isaiah 53, 4 says, Surely He hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem Him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him, and with His stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to His own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. The iniquity of you. If you will come in faith to Christ this morning. Your iniquity is on him. Your forgiveness is assured. And so come and trust in him. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. For the Father loveth the Son and hath given all things into his hand. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. The only way of escape from judgment is through Jesus, his mercy toward you. And so don't let his mercy slip away. Come and believe on the Lord Jesus. And now to us believers who have this forgiveness, I'd like us to see three things together. First, I want us to have enjoyment in His mercies this morning. We've sinned today. We've fallen short of the righteousness of God. We have uh, all uh, disappointed Him. But what does He pray for us? Father, forgive them. Your forgiveness. My forgiveness. Whatever we've done today, whatever we've done this past week, and whatever we do this week, God has forgiven us. Not as a license to sin, but as an assurance, as knowing that God loves us. He has forgiven us for Christ's sake. 
Romans 8.33, He who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect, it is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? Yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. He still makes that prayer for you today. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And he gets the petition that he asks for. I'd also like us to learn from his mercies in our own life and hold it forward to our fellow man. Have mercy stored up for one another because of Christ. Ephesians 4.30, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, uh, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. When we see the forgiveness of Christ, how God cleansed us for His sake, we should be turned in mercy to one another, to our families in our homes, our church family, and to our fellow man wherever we find ourselves. Let's turn in mercies towards them because Christ has shown us mercy. I'd also like us to remember to take the news of Christ's prayer to the world. Christ declared pardon. Christ declared the forgiveness of sins. And so should we. We should take that Jesus has died for the sins of men wherever we go, whoever we meet. Tell them that Jesus loves them and that Jesus offers them forgiveness this morning. Mark 16, 15 says, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Let's do just that as we've seen Jesus declare his mercy this morning. And again, if there's a believer in here, I pray that you would take hold of that mercy and come to trust in the Lord Jesus. And now let's go to our Lord in prayer. Father God, we come before you and Lord, we thank you for uh, your word. We thank you for the prayer of Jesus. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would help us to uh, be merciful as he was merciful and uh, to give the gospel as he proclaimed it. Lord, we ask that if there are any lost here, that you would draw them. We ask that you'd go with us and protect us. We ask that you'd be with our missionaries and our leaders as you always are. And Lord, that you'd be with us in our uh, own home worship, Lord, uh, to uh, be able to be pleasing to you there. And Lord, we love you and thank you. And we ask that you'd forgive us where we failed you. And it's in Christ's name we pray all this. Amen.